Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, thank you for having us, first of all. Um, I, some of you may have seen um, me in LA, uh, presented the first half of this case study in LA um, around our spring uh, campaign and how we use programmatic TV. So um, for those of you who were there, we promise to keep it interesting. We're gonna talk about programmatic TV, how Columbia's used it not only in spring at the time, but then the learnings, what we learned from that and how we took that into fall. Um, so first, I'm going to play a short video, a couple of minutes, um, just to give you guys an update on Columbia Sportswear brand, who we are. Um, some of you may have seen us um, or probably are pretty familiar with Columbia. We have pretty high um, awareness, but we've been up to some new things in the brand space over the last few years. So I'll play this, and then we'll get into the TV. This is Portland, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest. This is the type of weather you can expect from Portland. This is a sunny day. This is a windy day. This is a stormy day. This is a really, really stormy day. This is Columbia Sportswear Company, where they design, build, and test products for days like that in Portland for people that enjoy mountaintops, river trips, skiing, camping, climbing, surfing, fishing, running. <sighs> anyway, this is Gert Boyle, chairman of Columbia Sportswear. Gert is commonly referred to as Ma Boyle. Oh, I hate that Ma stuff. Or one tough mother. The tough mother? That I don't mind. Her favorite part about living in the Pacific Northwest is the weather. It's the perfect testing ground for Columbia's products. The only thing she loves more than the weather is her son, Tim. This is Tim. He is the most handsome, incredible, intelligent person. He's my son. What the hell? What am I going to say? <laughs> Tim's a sportsman. Can you me with her out? He's also a good sport. When Gert wanted to test a product, really test it, she called Tim. We have differences sometimes. Gert once put Tim through a car wash. Tim was hesitant. I voted against that. What better person to tell you that your product is good than your mother? Together, Tim and Gert produced and tested, and the more they tested, the more improvements and discoveries they made. And only if a piece of gear passed all these tests would Gert give it her legendary seal of approval. This was Gert's guarantee that a product was tested tough against every type of terrible, no good, day ruining, pain inducing, career ending condition the skies of the mighty Pacific Northwest will dish out. 20 years later, and Gert is still at it. It's perfect. Now make it better. This is the command handed down by Gert. Sure, it makes life hell for Columbia employees, but it means great gear for you. To this day, when customers see Gert's iconic, tested, tough stamp of approval, they know they're duly equipped to stay outside, long after the featherweights have retreated indoors. So, what's next for Columbia? I don't know. Well, Gert certainly isn't going anywhere. At 91, she still gets up to go to work and keep the tested tough ethos alive at Columbia. Yes, I do. Early to bed, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. She also had to be here for this interview. Thanks, Gert. Tested tough in the Pacific Northwest. So you can see um, Gert and the tested tough ethos has been something that we've been on as a brand for, for many years. Um, TV has always been a big part of that. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, too. Um, as a matter of fact, Gert is about to be 93. She turns 93 on March 6th um, and does come into the office every day. All of that is truth. I have literally been in her office when the phone has rung and she has picked it up and slammed it down, which is lovely as the person sitting across from her. Nothing is more important <laughs> than apparently the person she's talking to. But um, So a little bit about the brand architecture. Obviously, heard in the um, video about the Tested Tough platform. Um, as it relates to the seasons, obviously Columbia's has a pretty seasonal business. Um, our consumer benefit in that period of time um, per season that we talk about each of these benefits, whether it's war keeping the consumer warm, dry, cool, or protected, um, is really critical. So while we're out there with a the brand message, it's also really important that we talk about uh, that consumer benefit, and that relates to um, our, our TV choices and how we target during those seasons. 
Uh, just to let you know, obviously TV is a huge part of the campaign. Um, it is a multi-channel campaign and across multi-channels we're certainly trying to execute against that platform. So the situation. So overall, um, the goals with any season um, are really to drive positive sentiment, drive that brand love and equity. Um, that's through that delivery of that test to tough uh, messaging, certainly TV being a critical component to that. Uh, driving demand for products. So in any season, we want to be top of mind, obviously, uh, with the consumer when they're considering making those purchases, whether it's ski gear, rain jackets, um, gear you'd wear on the trail. And then three, deli deliver efficient media coverage. Uh, spring, as um, a season is traditionally uh, a season where we do not have as much resources and budget against it. So efficiency and being able to target the person at the right time in the right place, like we've heard about quite a bit today is, is critical. Um, and obviously one reason we use uh, programmatic TV. So I'm gonna show both of our spring 16 TV spot and our fall 16 TV spot. Um, again, it's all with the purpose of sort of showing the consumer under that test of tough platform that, that Columbia keeps you, in this case, dry, and in the case of fall, uh, warm and dry. Dry jacket. Tested tough in the Pacific Northwest. tagged sun and <laughs> in that one. Uh, we do use TV actually, um, it's worth noting, uh, to drive some of that lower funnel traffic into our retailers. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, nationally and local markets. So one of the things we've seen huge success with um, prior to actually programmatic TV even being an available tactic um, was coverage in our top markets. So we do not have we have budgets, but we don't have multi-multi-million dollars of budgets to have done linear TV nationally in the past. So we covered off on the top markets where we have heavy penetration from a distribution standpoint, making sure that um, we're in markets that obviously have uh, wholesale partners that carry our product and seen lots of, lots of success with that. So we wanted to make sure going into this programmatic TV um, that we were able to do that. And then another advantage obviously is supplementing that with a national overlay and being able to really use programmatic TV to drive um, the national exposure at a at targeted scale like we've all been talking about today um, and really reaching our outdoor enthusiasts. So again, really reaching our core target. Um, <clears throat> still though, there was quite a bit of conversation around Yes, we can cover off on local markets. Yes, we can cover off on national. How do we really get at the consumer um, when they're in that consideration phase? How do we get at them uh, when we know it's raining, when it's snowing, when it's horrible inclement weather? Um, how do we get in front of that curve and then also when it's happening? So um, we, we really looked at this strategy called owning the need state um, and really reaching them when they're in that state. And that's how Susan's gonna talk about a little bit about that. <clears throat> So the media mix um, obviously included TV. We included um, all channels really with respect to um, digital video um, all the way across through social. So um, really leveraging that primary asset of the TV spots, but then complementing that with other um, tactics across all channels. I wanted to make a note on, I just touched on it in terms of our historic TV strategy. Um, it was a bit of a sell-in job um, for execs to, sit, to go from buying broadcast, buying linear, having them really understand that, seeing, um, seeing sales increase in our local markets when we did that to, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna decrease that kind of spend and we're gonna move over to here to this digital way. Um, so there was, there was some history there that we had to sort of overcome, I think from a sell-in um, to executives, which we did, um, and all that sort of historic data was there, so we kind of had to move that over to here's why, here's why um, programmatic, and we'll talk about a little bit like that. 
Um, so the challenge in the season, obviously, um, audience potential is broad. Um, you know, weather happens everywhere. So how do you sort of address it at the right time, you know, in the right place um, and, and establish that efficiency? Um, in spring in particular, like I mentioned, budgets are quite smaller. So it's generally about a 30 to 70 split. Um, we, are, we are trying to even that out and have a more um, evergreen approach to an always-on media strategy. Programmatic TV obviously helps with that. Um, and, um, and then I talked about the national and local um, element and trying to sort of maintain that coverage. So the solve. I'll let Susan go into that. So in order to figure out how to reach this pretty broad audience in a medium that we all believed was impactful and in fact had proven through some match market testing was pretty impactful for Columbia business, Columbia's business, but with a budget that didn't really allow us to be as impactful as we wanted to in the channel. Um, so we looked at a couple different scenarios. If we went nationally, the budget would only allow us about one week at TRP levels that really weren't very effective. If we went locally, we could get four markets. We could at least get six weeks in solid TRP levels, but four markets is really probably not going to drive a global business as, uh, to the degree that we need for it to do. When we look at programmatic TV, that allowed us to get the national presence against the audience that we knew was most propensed to buy our product, as well as a heavy up in far more markets than we were able to afford, afford had we bought it through traditional linear channels. Eight weeks of, of activity and buy, only buying those households that matched our target audience as opposed to simply buying on propensity um, and allowing the, the waste that still comes from that. So programmatic TV, it was. And how we define programmatic TV since is one of those media phrases that changes, the definition changes depending on who you're talking to, is we define it by using data, data-driven um, audience buying. It's buying one-to-one -one versus buying mass. And of course, to the consumer, it looks like this, an ad that they see as purchased any other way. There's absolutely no difference whatsoever. The types of programmatic TV that we consider under this umbrella are addressable, the high index linear, which again has, is how media planning has been done effectively for some time, and then connected TV, buying households and programs based on um, devices like Roku, Apple, and um, Hulu, which is available through connected TV, not so much a connected TV device. For spring, because the budget was a l limited, we focused on the high index linear and the connected TV. And uh, what we were able to do was still some additional targeting on the connected TV side over what we had done. It allowed it for the weather triggering that Natalie mentioned that we need in or needed in order to own the need state. We could focus on the content that was most relevant to us and still get to some sort of effective scale. And we could do some cross-device targeting. And what we saw is that we increased our relevant reach. Our, maybe our adult 18 to 49 reach went down, but our outdoor, enthousi outdoor enthusiast reach went up significantly. And more importantly, we were able to be in those markets with a product message that resonated based on the weather that was happening when it was happening. It was more cost efficient than tra traditional TV. As you saw through the exercise that we went through, we were able to buy national penetration against the audience that is most important to us, as well as do a heavy up in some key markets instead of simply doing one or the other less well. Uh, a wider range of targeting. Uh, buying linear TV, we can do these data overlays, but you're still buying the entire program, whereas through advanced TV and programmatic, we are able to simply focus on, or at least more dollars, focused on those households most likely to buy our products. And something else that was very key is flexibility in market. We were able to move dollars around very quickly as we saw what was working and what wasn't. So on the, on the back end, on our end, um, we saw lift in consideration during that time period for rain product. We did a brand study at the time that contributed to that. Um, we did see increased rainwear searches and product page views. So um, on the e-commerce side of the business, we use product page views, visits, time on site, obviously as a proxy for consideration in addition to that brand study in terms of how we measure it. Um, and then through the brand study too, we saw that we were lifting boats in terms of those key brand attributes, fun, approachable. The consumers were parroting back what we hoped they would around the test and test platform and what that means. So all around really happy with the results. <clears throat> Some things we learned for spring that we applied to fall is that the technology limitations, we know there's an inventory supply and figuring out how to manage that based on the technology at the household level and at the network level. And it's something that, that becomes very clear during the planning process. 
um, which also results in a longer and more intensive planning period. It took the team more hours in order to plan effectively and over a longer period of time. Um, we also see a great benefit in testing more. This was simply an initial test to see if we could be as effective with programmatic TV as we had been with spot TV when we, when we did the match market test there. Um, and we could have been more complex with the data targeting, which is something that we implemented for fall. So the first thing is that we expanded into new platforms, adding in addressable TV and even some uh, traditional linear spot TV. Um, we focused on the top performing day parts and networks. We found that prime time, late fringe, and weekend is really those day parts, or were really those day parts that had the greatest effect on our brand metrics. So for fall, we focused solely on those day parts. And then we added third party retailer data to the outdoor enthusiast targeting that we had done in the spring. So as I said, we added addressable and spot TV. I'm stepping on myself here. Um, for traditional spot TV, we, we purchased that because we, we still believed, even going into this for the second time, that programmatic TV was really more remnant inventory, and we felt that there's a lot of value in being around premium content, like sports sponsorships, and the water cooler programming, like The Voice. Um, so we bought some spot TVs to make sure that we had placements in those environments. Then addressable, we bought top 15 markets, the outdoor enthusiasts, and then retail purchases, purchasers. So those people who had purchased at our top retailers over a certain period of time. Um, continued with the, the high index linear, so again, we could get those programs that our audience was most propensed to watch, and then connected TV, which was the um, cross included cross device. And as a result, we saw significant over-delivery. This is one of our biggest learnings, that through this program, we over-delivered by about 20%, which is pretty significant for TV, and we sure could have used those dollars someplace else. So going in for the next season, we'd probably try and index at about 90, not to assume that we're going to over-deliver to the same degree, but making sure that we use our dollars wisely. Um, because we saw that, that this really impacted, this program really impacted site activities, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in just a moment. And then the multi-platform um, approach really got us some premium programming. We, we perhaps in retrospect didn't actually need to buy that spot TV in order to get that water cooler programming. So we, across the three platforms, and I'm not going to talk about spot TV since that was purchased more traditionally, and all I could tell you really is impressions. But what you see by this breakdown is that across addressable TV, we know how many impressions we got, and we also know how many people completed um, the, the watching the entire ad. Um, for linear TV, which is obviously where we got the vast majority of our impressions, we don't actually know what happened and how many people saw um, the ad. And then connected TV, we had about a 93% view rate. So for addressable and connected, we were able to get some good metrics on how many people saw our ad. Going back to that idea, we, we need ad ratings, not just content ratings. Um, and this is a spectacular learning. We partnered with DataZoo, and we used their cross-device measurement um, graph in order to understand how our advertising worked. TV is primarily used as a brand uh, upper funnel, brand metric, ch changing brand perceptions, fun and approachable. But we also, it is too expensive to have a sole purpose. So we need to make sure that we're driving business. And what we saw is that the, this programmatic effort had a significant impact on site product searches. So if you look at connected TV, we saw about a 31% lift in product pages, product page visits. And addressable TV, there's a 17% lift. So what's interesting about that is, first of all, that we know it, that this is directly attributed based on um, device matching, but also um, that there's such a difference between the connected TV audience and how they behave and the um, addressable TV audience and how they behave. So that's a learning that we probably use for next time as well, knowing that both are important because they're bringing something to the table. But if connected TV is going to drive greater response, then as that scales, we probably want to scale dollars with that as well. Uh, and this is just a quick highlight of the programs that we purchased. So as you see, you think of programmatic TV as remnant as the new way to talk about direct response where you're largely in daytime. We were in some really high profile programming like Gold Rush in Alaska, which are some of Discovery's top programs. It's always sunny in Philadelphia, which is a little bit more cult, but still very um, high quality content. On the addressable side, things like American Horror Story and Suits. So th there is no remnant, remnant inventory. We were exactly where we wanted to be, exactly where we needed to be, reaching exactly the households that we knew were most likely to buy our product. 
Yes, yeah, so we got some great results, obviously, as Susan just men mentioned. Um, we saw increase in consideration in our top 15 markets. That data uh, comes from YouGov. Um, we had really, as she mentioned, and really effective, obviously, uh, CPM and um, effective CPM. We have premium programming. Um, the over-delivery obviously contributed to that. Um, and then again, lift in Columbia.com page views um, as a proxy for consideration, which we were really excited about. So what we learned for fall that we would apply to future initiatives is, is that idea that, that because inventory control is still a work in progress on the TV side, that we should probably assume some level of, of over delivery and plan accordingly so that we can put our dollars um, to testing different things like sequential targeting. So this, the last two rounds that we did were more about connecting or testing different devices and different data sets. Um, something that we'd like to do for next time is, is test the messaging sequence. So since we are doing cross-device, can we get a better response if we do an ABC message versus a BCA message sequence? Um, and that's something that we would work very closely with the creative agency to do because part of what hinders that is when you're planning in parallel um, creative and media and that they don't give the creatives enough time to do that multi-segment um, content. Um, look beyond impression, impression tracking. We have tested historically for Columbia well before using programmatic TV and to be able to understand what television adds to plan. Um, but this gives us a whole additional level to that and it's more um, attributable, more trackable, more data driven, so it's probably more likely to be believed by leadership and incorporated into future initiatives. And then continue to think cross-device, cross-channel. So not just d different messaging sequence, but also is there a different channel and messaging sequence that could result in even greater outcomes. So in general, we were, we were very pleased with programmatic TV and we'll continue to use it as it makes sense. It allows us to get a far more effective and efficient reach across more households, more targeted, there's less waste, and our dollars are too precious for us to be able to afford waste. And we're able to truly show what it is that the, the dollars drove, um, either singularly or as part of the overall media mix. That's our story. Any questions? Oh, 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 oh. It's